Okay, we're going to wrap up chapter six. This will be module two of two. And we'll begin by sharing the screen here with the last slide of the previous module, which talks about a topic that we've actually already spent considerable amount of time discussing back in chapter one. So I'm not going to beat a dead horse here, but you should take a few moments and re familiarize yourself with this classic uh, regulatory mechanism to ensure that we maintain a fairly constant body temperature. And obviously the skin plays a very important role in helping to do just that. Um, and this really pertains to the effectors you see here, uh, those that can assist in bringing body temperatures back down from elevated levels or um, helping bring temperatures up from depressed levels. Um, so again, take some time, review that. I'm not gonna spend time talking about it right now. Your book does uh, describe heat production and heat loss there on uh, section 6.3 under skin functions. So do take some time and look over conduction and convection and evaporation. Here's our uh, typical chunk of skin. Hopefully you recognize some structures here, including the epidermis, of course. Uh, here's our dermis and uh, adipose tissue in the deep dermis and subcutaneous layer or, or hypodermis. And of course the skin shaft and hair follicle. And here's some uh, sebaceous gland and of course blood vessels that extend from the subcutaneous layer up into the dermis and eventually a lot of these will terminate in capillary beds uh, in the dermal papillae which is what I'm pointing to here and we don't necessarily see any sketches of blood capillaries in this particular diagram but you can go back to one of the earlier figures in chapter six and you'll see those dermal papillae that contain uh, blood capillaries and occasionally also those Meissner's or tactile corpuscles. So we want to talk really next about what happens when we suffer an injury, uh, specifically a cut and a burn. What, what are those two uh, phenomena and how does our skin uh, respond to damage? We have all experienced cuts, um, be they paper cuts or when you're uh, preparing dinner and you accidentally slice uh, your, your index finger with a paring knife, um, or you're out working and you uh, brush up against concrete, for example, and you get, a, you get some injury, start bleeding. We all, again, have had that occur. And within a few days, depending upon the extent of the injury, um, you don't even know where that cut was. It doesn't take long for that to repair itself. So let us assume that we have some uh, damage here, a cut that has, has extended obviously through the epidermis and down into part of the dermis. Uh, and remember, we're only talking a millimeter or so in thickness here. This is all that cut is. It's not very deep, but it's enough to sever uh, obviously these blood vessels. And when you cut blood vessels, you're going to have blood spilling out into that open area. In addition to the RBCs, which we of course can see as blood streaming from our finger, um, we also have white blood cells present, of course, and platelets. And so the white blood cells are going to be extremely important in helping to phagocytize any possible pathogens that could have been introduced with the injury in the wound um, the platelets are going to assist in the formation of a potential blood clot. Um, actually, initially, something called a platelet, platelet plug will form. We'll talk more about that when we get into um, chapter 14 on the blood. But this, this formation of um, blood cells here that spill into this affected area um, are 
assisting in what we would refer to as the inflammatory response uh, or inflammation. We've all suffered from inflammation. We have some pain, some tenderness, maybe some bleeding, painful to the touch. Um, but this, this uh, inflammation that we, don't not, we do not necessarily like to experience is really our body's way of beginning that healing process. So eventually, if it's, a, if it's a fairly significant injury, we may find formation, of course, of a blood clot here toward the top of the surface of the skin, below which are these macrophages, which are uh, actually a type of white blood cell. Uh, it's referred to as a monocyte that has left the bloodstream, gone out into the tissues. And again, if you look at the word macro means large, phage, phagocytic. These are big white blood cells that love to phagocytize bacteria. And they are there to do just that. We also note the presence of fibroblasts here. These kind of light blue elongated structures are, are uh, the fibroblasts. And does anybody remember what fibroblasts do? Hopefully you remember from chapter five that fibroblasts are extremely important cells within many, many types of connective tissues and their role or purpose is in the secretion and production of various fibers that we find within connective tissue. And I hope again, you know which three major fibers I'm talking about. If you don't, you should go back in chapter five and review those. In addition, we see angiogenesis taking place. Now, what is that you ask? Well, we did talk about angiogenesis back when we were discussing cancer, if you recall, at the end of chapter three. We said one property of cancer was angiogenesis, which is the formation of blood vessels. Now here, we're reestablishing re -establishing, uh, blood vessel formation because we are repairing that damaged area of the, derm the dermis and eventually the epidermis. So here we see, in fact, that blood again has begun to um, the blood vessels have begun to reform, moving upward, if you will, toward the surface from that damaged site. We see the fibroblasts have begun to uh, lay down various fibers to reconstruct that dermis, which if you remember from earlier in the chapter was made up of uh, dense irregular connective tissue. And there's probably also some loose connective or areolar tissue present in the dermis as well. Um, we also have the formation uh, of what is referred to as granulation tissue, or your book just uses the term granulations, these small rounded masses that um, often form during uh, the repair process very near the um, blood clot, just underneath the blood clot, near where the tissue is being regenerated is this so-called granulation tissue. And it's here that those collagen secreting fibroblasts are at, at their, their peak. They're really laying down a lot of uh, connective tissue very near that granulation tissue area. And of course, we see the presence of macrophages, which continue to mop up any foreign invaders that might be there. Also, they might digest um, any of the unusable tissue that's being generated, kind of just kind of polishing things off, making sure things are being properly laid down and there aren't you know, small pieces of debris still possibly present there. We've already talked about the fibroblasts, what they do. And um, a lot of these fibroblasts will respond to the presence of what we call growth factors, which are produced in response to the damage that has occurred to the tissues. So the tissues that are damaged often produce the growth factors and they sort of feed back upon themselves to encourage additional cell division and regrowth, regeneration. So those fibroblasts are often laying down these new collagen fibers in response to growth factors being produced often by some of the damaged cells. 
Eventually, we may form a scab, again, at the very top, this is sort of dry blood area. Um, notice that we have almost fully reformed our dermis. Um, the epidermis, likewise, is being reestablished. We are reforming the basement membrane that was destroyed. We're laying down more uh, layers here of the epidermis, starting with the stratum basale layer and spinosum and granulosum and lucidum and finally corneum here shown at the very top in, in yellow. Um, so eventually, as we get very near the end of that repair process, of course, the scab will eventually fall off. And we might possibly have a scar present, depending upon how extensive the injury was and where that occurred. So we've all probably had cuts in our lives when we were kids, and we can still see that little scar that's left over. But it's amazing uh, how regenerative our, our skin is. Um, in terms of having had a cut and a few days later, a week later, we don't even remember where that exactly was. It's, it's just almost invisible. But it really does depend upon the extent of injury. So this is a figure in your book, figure 6.13, that sort of summarizes again the various uh, steps in the healing of a wound. The other topic that I'd like to talk about in chapter 6 as we wrap this chapter up is a discussion about burns. And we have all suffered from some extent of burn. Um, and so let's talk about the three major types of burns, starting off with the uh, least invasive of the three. This is referred to as a first degree burn. This is the common lexicon that's used or language first degree. It's technically referred to as a superficial partial thickness burn. Superficial meaning it's pretty much only impacting the superficial surface of the skin. The epidermis is that part of the skin that is most impacted by a first degree burn. We don't generally have any significant damage to the dermis or further underlying tissues. Um, what would cause a superficial partial thickness burn? Well, something like a sunburn. So again, we've all experienced that where the skin gets very, very red. There could be some minor, minor pain associated with it, often itching, right? You've ever had a bad, bad sunburn and uh, after a day or two, it just the itching almost drives a person crazy. Um, we don't have any scarring generally. Um, to a typical burn, we, skin will peel as a result of uh, the death of those surface cells. Um, but usually after a while, um, it, it kind of subsides. Um, we do see some edema here, some swelling, which uh, is not that uncommon in a really bad sunburn. But generally no, no long-term lasting impacts by these superficial partial thickness or first degree burns. We move it up a notch here to what's called deep partial thickness or second degree burns. So here we have the deeper layers of the epidermis being impacted as well as some of the upper levels of the dermis could be destroyed as a result of a second degree burn. Here you're definitely gonna have blistering and edema which is swelling due to damage to some of these dermal capillaries uh, remember, we talked just a few moments ago about how um, the capillary beds can extend as far north, if you will, or can extend as high up into the dermal papillae, um, which is right near that boundary between the dermis and the epidermis. Um, there are instances of um, scarring that can occur in these types of burns. Um, Notice on the slide, it indicates like what might cause these kinds of burns. Exposure to a hot liquid, um, a boiling pot of water that gets spilled on a child could cause a deep partial thickness burn. Um, if your clothes come, uh, started on fire and you weren't able to put that out right away, this, certainly the skin would burn, at least the, uh, again, the upper levels of the uh, dermis and certainly the uh, epidermis. And we can kind of see that has occurred here on the right hand photograph. Um, there is still 
generally repair that can take place or regeneration of damaged tissues. Um, again, it, it doesn't mean you could not have potential scarring, you, you may, but generally the dermis that's been impacted and the epidermis uh, do regenerate and reform. This again is much more painful and the recuperation process and timetable is gonna be longer than in a partial thickness or first degree burn. It's the third degree or full thickness burns that of course are the worst. So here we're talking about total destruction of the epidermis and the dermis, and it could, it could uh, extend deeper depending upon, again, the exact actual cause of this particular burn. Could get down into the connective tissues or muscle could be impacted, of course. Uh, and so we're talking here about uh, more prolonged exposure to flames, um, even some really nasty acids and bases, corrosive chemicals can cause burns, doesn't have to necessarily be flames, can be chemical burns too. And those are among the worst. Um, any of these causative agents can, can really be um, life-threatening to someone who's had a, a significant proportion of their body surface impacted by a third degree burn. Um, Scarring is very likely. Um, and somebody who is suffering from a full thickness burn um, has to watch out for two things. One is infection, because as we know, the skin is an effective barrier against pathogens that we're exposed to on a daily basis. Uh, and uh, even though you know, our epidermis dermis is only a, a millimeter or two at the most thick. It is an effective barrier. But now you remove that epidermis and remove that dermis, any bacteria that could fall from the air even onto that surface and could, could start an infection that could move inward and cause major, major issues. Um, the other major uh, problem that patients, burn patients face in addition to infection is the loss of water. Um, our skin keeps our, our liquids inside us, so to speak. Uh, and if we don't have that, that barrier there, that covering, um, we can actually lose excess water. It can cause real issues with blood pressure and, and kidney function and other things of that nature. So what can one do in the case of a full thickness burn? Well, I've listed a couple different bulleted items there um, that medicine has, has been using for a number of years, including something called an autograft. Uh, an autograft is something uh, that involves removing uh, a piece of skin from another part of your body and, and then uh, replacing that burned area. I've seen videos where they, they show uh, what appears to be like a, a little balloon that they inflate underneath the skin and they slowly inflate that balloon, thus stretching the skin. And this happens over a period of probably several weeks, if not months. And then that stretched skin is cut and used to replace the area that's been burned. And they just suture the remaining segment, you know, back. Um, so autographs are, again, uh, use of tissue from another region of the body. Um, an allograft is tissue taken from another individual, from another person. This is often um, a source of skin that comes from the use of cadavers. So somebody um, who has recently tragically died in the car accident, for example, and the family provides uh, as many harvestable tissues as one can to help other people, right? The, the eyes, the corneas, and heart, and lungs, you know. The skin is another very important piece of tissue that is often used, um, at least for allografts. So there are actually skin banks out there that, um, can be used as a source of, of skin. Um, synthetic skin 
and skin substitutes like you see there. Um, there's a little blurb in your book about tissue engineered skin, artificial skin. There's a lot of research that has been done on this. Um, some of these are used as kind of stop gap uh, coverings until maybe uh, an autograft or an allograft might be available. But I think they are also trying to engineer more permanent materials that can be used in place of the skin. Now, again, think about what they've got to overcome in, in developing and, and creating these synthetic substitutes. The skin has to be able to, to uh, allow materials to move in and out. Um, it's got to maintain the moisture at the same time as it allows for diffusion of gases and things of that sort. So it's a, it's a pretty amazing uh, tissue. If anyone's looking for a good topic for their extra credit paper, uh, I'm sure this would be a very interesting one and, and a lot of information about synthetic skin and skin substitutes, as well as the use of, of allografts and or autographs. So the way in which physicians assess the extent to which there's been a uh, third degree or full thickness burn is to utilize something called the rule of nines. And the math is actually fairly self-explanatory. What you're looking at here, of course, are both anterior and posterior views of the body. And what they've done is they've sort of divided up various quadrants of the body um, in uh, multiples of four and a half percent. So for example, if you look at the anterior head, we're saying that occupies about four and a half percent of the body surface. Same for the back posterior portion of the head, four and a half percent. Um, the arms likewise get four and a half, four and a half, four and a half, four and a half. Anterior and posterior trunk get a little over twice that with 18 percent respectively. And then the front uh, anterior and posterior surfaces of the leg getting basically twice the arm percentage, so nine to nine. So when you tally up all of the anterior body surface, that's gonna equal 50%, the posterior 50% for a total of 100% surface area. And so uh, you can see where the, the term rule of nines comes in. So it's sort of like a derivative or multiple of nines or half of nine. So that's how physicians basically assess, um, you know, quantitatively, the extent of the burn. All right, well, that wraps up our first chapter in ANP, which is the integumentary system. Next week, we begin the chapter on the skeletal system, chapter seven.